This is the lecture for A Rose for Emily by William Faulkner. Again, we're going to start with a brief biography of Faulkner. He was born to a wealthy family in Mississippi, the oldest of four brothers. His mother and grandmother were both avid readers and artists themselves. They were among the early influences in his creative life, as was Carolyn Barr, the black woman who raised and educated him. When he was still a boy, Faulkner's family moved to Oxford, Mississippi, where his grandfather owned several businesses. Faulkner would go on to spend most of his life there. He was both a high school and college dropout, despite obvious intelligence and talent. Uh, Faulkner published uh, his first book in 1924. It was a collection of poetry entitled The Marble Fawn. After this, he dedicated himself exclusively to fiction, including novels, short stories, and screenplays. Despite persistent financial difficulties and his crippling alcoholism, Faulkner would go on to complete a multitude of novel novels, including such masterpieces as The Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, Light in August, and Absalon, Absalon. For his literary achievement, Faulkner was awarded the 1949 Nobel Prize in Literature. He died some 13 years later of a heart attack in Bihala, Mississippi. All right, the historical context of A Rose for Emily. After the North defeated the South in the American Civil War, slavery was abolished, and many of the wealthy white Southern families consequently lost their primary source of income in agriculture. As is quite likely the case with the Gerson, uh, Gersons featured and arose for Emily. During the Reconstruction era that followed the Civil War, the U.S. government implemented policies designed to economically rehabilitate the South and secure the rights of free blacks with relatively little success. Soon after the Reconstruction era ended in 1877, many Southern communities defiantly regressed to old cultural norms, which involved aristocratic ideals founded on those established during the heyday of Southern slave-owning plantations and the marginalization and persecutions of black Americans. This is the world of A Rose for Emily, where a yearning for a glorified Southern past conflict with social and industrial change and progress. Um, other books related to A Rose for Emily. Um, a Rose for Emily participates in the Southern Gothic genre, which applies the conventions of Gothic fiction, such as gloomy and eerie settings, eccentric and grotesque characters, as well as the sense of dreadful mystery and ghostly handiness to the American South after the Civil War. Earlier Gothic fiction includes works like Horace Wadpole's Castle of Otranto, Anne Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Adolfo, and those composed by the American Edgar Allan Poe. It is by drawing on works like these that Faulkner and other Southerners he influenced including Carson McCullers, Flannery O'Connor, and Cormac McCarthy, examined and conveyed with such effective horror how haunted and paralyzed the South after the Civil War by its conception of its own glorified and genteel past, a past nonetheless morally contaminated by the racist, oppressive, and dehumanizing industry, institution rather, of slavery. All right, some key facts uh, about A Rose for Emily. It was written in Oxford, Mississippi. It was published on April the 30th, 1930. The literary period is American modernism. The genre was Southern Gothic. The setting is the fictional town of Jefferson, Mississippi, located in the fictional Yoknapathawatha County, where many of Faulkner's works are set. The climax is when the townspeople discover that Miss Emily murdered Homer Barron and lived with his corpse. The antagonist is the Southern society's paralyzing nostalgia for a glorified past, 
as well as its rigid customs and conventions. The point of view is first person plural, we, limited. Um, many of you will notice that uh, the story is entitled A Rose for Emily. However, Emily never receives a rose. Faulkner explained in an interview, Oh, that was an allegorical title. The meaning was, here was a woman who had had a tragedy, an irrevocable tragedy, and nothing could be done about it, and I pitied her. And this was a salute, just as if you were to make a gesture, a salute to anyone, to a woman, you would hand a rose. Um, Colonel Soteris, a minor character in A Rose for Emily, appears in other works by Faulkner, including the novels Flags in the Dust and The Young Vanquished. He is modeled on Faulkner's own great-grandfather, William Clark Faulkner, a Confederate colonel in the Civil War, a businessman, and an author. All right, I'm going to give you a summary for A Rose for Emily. Uh, it opens in the 20th century on the day Miss Emily Grierson's funeral uh, was held uh, in the once grand, now decaying Grierson family house. Many townspeople were in attendance, not only to pay their respects, but also out of curiosity, for no one had seen the interior of the Grierson house in 10 years. However, the narrative quickly shifts back in time and describes an episode in which Colonel Serratus the then mayor of Jefferson, Mississippi, excused Miss Emily from having to pay taxes in 1894. He did so because she was both impoverished and unmarried despite being in her 40s. Almost 20 years after Soteris granted this amnesty to Miss Emily, however, a newer generation of men had assumed power in uh, Jefferson with modern ideas and a more pragmatic approach to governess. This generation found the arrangements Soteris had made with Miss Emily dissatisfying, but despite their persistence, they failed in their several attempts to exact taxes from this increasingly reclusive woman. The narrator then likens the small victory of Miss Emily's, her continuing avoidance of taxes, to one she secured 30 years earlier, when she was in her 30s. Neighbors complained to the then mayor of Jefferson, Judge Stevens, that a bad smell was issuing from Miss Emily's place. But Stevens refused to inform Miss Emily of this for fear of humiliating her. Instead, four men were dispatched to investigate the smell in secret and to spread an odor neutralizing agent lime on Miss Emily's property. The smell went away thereafter. Their narrator takes a final step back in time to two years before the bad smell was detec detected. Miss Emily's father died, leaving her a pauper. Miss Emily denied that he was dead, however, and would have kept his courts had town authorities not intervened. In the same year as her father's death, a construction company headed by a northerner named Homer Barron arrived in town to pave the sidewalks. He and Miss Emily came to be involved Oh, came to be sweethearts, despite the scandal of a southern woman of genteel birth being romantically involved with a northern laborer. The townspeople were only further scandalized, however, when they learned that Homer was, by his own account, not a marrying man. Consequently, the Baptist minister's wife wrote to two of Emily's haughty female cousins, who duly arrived in Jefferson to live with Miss Emily and oversee her conduct. Soon after, Homer deserted Emily, Miss Emily. She bought poison, arsenic, to commit suicide, the townspeople assumed. Yet her cousins departed within the week, and Homer returned to her within three days of their departure, leading the townspeople to suspect it was only the haughty cousin who had driven Homer away. The day he returned, Homer was admitted into Miss Emily's house at dusk. Yet Homer Barron was never seen again, and the townspeople assumed that he had abandoned her after all. A lot of assumptions by the townspeople, aren't there? The narrator then moves forward, back up to Miss Emily's funeral. 
The narrator recalls how after Miss Emily was buried, the townspeople found and eventually forced entry into a locked room in her house, where they discovered Homer Barron's corpse, corpse laid out in a bed, and on a pillow next to his head, a strand of Miss Emily's hair. <clears throat> All right, we're going to talk about the themes. The themes are kind of complicated, so listen up, take notes. I don't know that any of you are doing these things, but if you are, <laughs> pay attention. All right, the post-Civil War South theme analysis. Before the American Civil War, known as the Antebellum South, the South's economy relied on the African agricultural output of plantation, large farms owned by wealthy southern whites who exploited black slave labor to keep operating costs as low as possible. By its very nature, plantation life gave rise to a rigid social hierarchy, one in which healthy white farmers were treated like aristocrats, middle class and poor whites like commoners, and blacks like property. Along with this social hierarchy, plantation life also gave rise as an aristocratic culture that valued very highly chivalric ideas, those associated with the institution of medieval knighthood, like courage, honor, or excuse me, ideals, like courage, honor, courtesy, social propriety, female virginity, and a readiness to help the weak. A Rose for Emily is set in the South after the Civil War, the post-bellum South, after slavery had been abolished and plantation life had collapsed. With their society and economic ruins, however, Southerners did not give up on their aristocratic culture, but rather clung to it, nostalgically and yearned to return to a past more glorious in memory than it ever was in reality. This historical situation underlies Faulkner's depiction of the southern and fictional town of Jefferson, Mississippi in A Rose for Emily. The very epitome of the Old South in the short story is Colonel Satoris, who as mayor passed a racist law forcing black women to wear their aprons in public, an insidious reminder of the old social hierarchy of the South, and who in 1894 excuses Miss Emily from paying taxes to Jefferson in a chivalric impulse, or on a chivalric impulse. I've got a typo. In addition, Miss Emily Gerson's family is presented as having been once wealthy and still highly respected in their southern community. They quite likely belonged to the aristocratic class of slaveholders before the Civil War, though their fortune in the postbellum world has since dwindled. Nonetheless, the family is as proud of its aristocratic heritage as Satoris is, so much so that Emily's father refuses to let his daughter become romantically involved with anyone of a lower social class. The townspeople of Jefferson not only approve of, but seem to protect and uphold such rigid adherence to their old traditions. Even after Miss Emily's father dies and Miss Emily comes to think of herself as being socially better than her poverty would justify, the townspeople nonetheless tolerate her haughtiness because she is a living monument to their glorified past, just as significant to them in this respect as the Gerson family house itself or the cemetery where Civil War soldiers are buried. All right, tradition versus progress theme analysis. Even as white Southerners in the short story cling to their pre-Civil War traditions, ideals, and institutions, the world around them is quickly changing. Agriculture is being supplanted by industry, and, a, and aristocratic neighborhoods with their proud plantation-style houses like the Grierson's, are being encroached upon by less grandiose but more economically practical garages and cotton gins. Likewise, the post-Satorist generation of authorities in Jefferson, those men who belong to the Board of Aldermen that, govern the, that governs the town, are increasingly, move, increasingly moving away from their forebearers' aristocratic 
and chivalric ideas towards more modern ideas and practical progressive governance. Hence their decision to try to exact, exact taxes from Miss Emily after all, even if unsuccessfully. While many years earlier, the gallant old Judge Stephen balks at the idea of telling a lady to her face that her property stinks, the authorities from this newer generation, we might imagine, would have had fewer qualms about doing so. The principal figure of progress in Jefferson is Homer Barron, who has not only been contracted to pave the sidewalks in town, thereby making the town more accessible to all members of society, and what is a small act of both technological progress and a small act of democratization, but also becomes a great favorite in town despite being from the North. It seems like the North and the South, torn apart during the Civil War, are becoming reconciled to one another and reintegrated once more. However, the townspeople's conflicted attitude towards Homer, they think him a fine fellow, yet don't think he is good enough to court Miss Emily, is indicative of their broader ambivalence about progress in Jefferson. They are perhaps prepared to industrialize and modernize their infrastructure and methods of governance. They are even prepared to socialize with Northerners, but they are not yet prepared to part with the last vestige of the Old South or its rigid social hierarchy and culture of honor and sexual propriety. Miss Emily herself is perhaps the character in the short story most conflicted over tradition and progress and most victimized by her society's cultural paralysis. She retains her aristocratic manner even after sinking into poverty. She refuses eligible suitors as beneath her even as she passes from the prime of her youth. And she even bizarrely denies her father's death as though incapable incapable of psychologically surveying the financial surviving the financial and social change his death entails for her. But, just as the future of spinsterhood seems imminent, Miss Emily almost miraculously adapts to the times by becoming romantically involved with Homer, a man not only from a lower social class than she, but a northerner to boot. Financial necessity, no doubt, influences her change in standard and manner, but also a genuine, genuine human need for companionship. However, the townspeople who are charmed and friendly with Homer nonetheless think this is a step too far in the direction of progress and are at first piteous of Miss Emily's fall and later scandalized by the possibility that she is having physical relations with a man not serious about marriage. Progressive behavior indeed. It is her society's inability to commit wholly to progress to adaptation that in part compels the already mentally unstable Miss Emily to create with poison and dusty secrecy a private world safely frozen in the past, unchanging. <clears throat> All right, Patri Patriarchal Duty and Control Theme Analysis Members of Jefferson's Board of Aldermen, whether old and gallant and nostalgic for the Old South like Sartorius or young and businesslike such as the newer generation of authorities, all have something in common. They are all male and govern, govern over and to the exclusion of women. Faulkner foregrounds this dynamic when he has his narrator rec recall Satoris's law requiring all black women to wear their aprons in public and dramatizes it in Miss Emily's relationships with her father and the town authorities themselves. For even in private life, the men in Jefferson exert full control over women's lives, as Emily's father does in telling his daughter which suitors she may or may not allow to court her. Indeed, social repression, stiff propriety, and a fetishization of female virginity characterize the Southern culture portrayed in her story, in the story. However, one reason Miss Emily draws so much attention to herself in town is because she often resists patriarchal authority, as when she flat out refuses to pay her taxes. 
Here she plays the old generation of patriarchal authority against the newer. Or when she forbids the installation of a mailbox and postal numbers on her property. Even courting Homer Bell is a subtle act of rebellion on Miss Emily's part. Homer Bell? Homer Baron is a subtle... <laughs> is a subtle act of rebellion on Miss Emily's part against her society's social conventions and presumably the wishes of her dead father. Given how predetermined the course of her life has been, not only by the Jefferson Patriarchs, but also by the Civil War and its aftermath and the code of conduct enforced on her by her society, it is no wonder that Miss Emily attempts to take control of her own life, to live on her own terms, to be the master of her own fate. Her ultimate gesture to this end, of course, is the murder of Homer and her lifelong marriage, as it were, to his rotting, dust-suffused corpse. Instead of letting Homer leave her, Miss Emily asserts absolute control over his life, literally turning him into an object which she can manipulate at will. The madly desperate, horrific nature of this crime speaks to just how oppressed and stifled Miss Emily is, as well as to the huge denial of freedom which her society subjects her to. That her great-aunt Wyatt went mad, too, suggests that Miss Emily's is not an isolated case, although it would be misguided to insist on this comparison past a certain point. The subjugation of women in this story quietly reflects the even more virulent subjugation of black Americans at the hands of the white South, as Toby's presence in the story quietly reminds us. Time and Narrative Theme Analysis A Rose for Emily is not a linear story, where the first event treated brings about the next, and so on. Rather, it is nonlinear jumping back and forth in time. However, there is a method to this temporal madness. The story opens with Miss Emily's funeral, then goes back in time, slowly revealing the central events of Miss Emily's life, before going back forward in time to the funeral. There, in the story's final scene, the townspeople discover in Homer's corpse and the strand of Miss Emily's hair the facts that make sense of all the events described before. For example, that Miss Emily brought arsenic from the druggist while in her 30s, not to commit suicide as the townspeople suspected, but rather to murder, to murder her defective sweetheart. So, why does Faulkner structure the story like this? Toward the end of the story, its narrator makes a generalization about time that can be brought to bear on this question. For old people, all the past is not a diminishing road but instead a huge meadow which no winter ever quite touches, divided from them now by the narrow bottleneck of the most recent decade of years. Looked at in this light, doesn't the nonlinear nature of the story present the past it describes less as a diminishing road and more as a meadow in which one might meander backward toward a glorified past? And it is almost as if the townspeople's nostalgia of the Old South, their desire to go back to a time they remember or mythologicalize as better, infl infects their storytelling practices and lined with garages. Nope. Perhaps, at least for now, it would be better if Jefferson got back onto the road of time paved and lined with garages, and left their increasingly irrelevant social conventions in the dust. If only the past had been a diminishing road for Miss Emily, rather than a huge rose-colored meadow where only corpses and the dust grow. All right, gossip, social conventions, and the judgment theme analysis. A rose for Emily is narrated by a plural we voice which stands in from the memory of the collective town. In this way, the story can be read as the town's collective, nostalgically tinged, darkly disturbed memory. And yet that collective voice has a darker edge than a simple collective memory. 
Because of that collective narrator, A Rose for Emily is also a collection of town's gossip, gossip centering, centering on Miss Emily, generated by decades of intense scrutiny on her life. The townspeople watch Miss Emily very closely, both because of their own nostalgia for the pre-Civil War South makes her necessary to them as a representative of their aristocratic heritage, but also because as an individual she is eccentric, pitiable, exciting to watch, and exciting to judge behind closed doors. Indeed, the we narrator almost seems sometimes aware that they have darker motives for scrutinizing Miss Emily's life, like taking a pleasure in her fall to poverty, a feeling of social superiority over when she begins to court Homer, and the like. But it is also through scrutiny and gossip that the society in Jefferson enforces its social conventions. For example, it is the gossip of ladies that leads the Baptist minister's wife to write to Miss Emily's cousins, who themselves come to Jefferson to scrutinize and oversee Miss Emily's conduct with Homer. 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 Whom, not serious about marriage, the town implicitly judges a danger to Miss Emily's virginity and her ability to uphold the lost social convention the town's conventions the town requires her to. It is almost as if the town needs Miss Emily to be the representative of its lost, mythologicalized past and hates her for it. Ironically, for all that the townspeople watch and judge Miss Emily, for all that they intervene to make sure that she doesn't violate the social conventions of Jefferson, they nevertheless fail to realize, despite her buying the arsenic, despite the bad smell issuing from her place, despite the fact that Homer was last seen going into her house at dusk, that Miss Emily has in secret committed a dreadful and horrifying crime, nor do they realize just how damaged a woman she is prior to committing the crime itself. The implication is that close scrutiny does not a close community make. Social bonds consisting solely of gossip and judgment are not enough for people living together to truly know and care for one another. All right, characters, minor characters. There's the druggist who sells Miss Emily arsenic even though she does not comply with their law requiring you to tell what you are going to use it for, as he puts it. There's Miss Emily's two female cousins, even haughtier than Miss Emily is. These cousins come from Alabama to Jefferson to live with Miss Emily and oversee her conduct, presumably to make sure that she doesn't violate their Southern society's strict code of property propriety while she and Homer are romantically involved with one another. There's Judge Stevens, the mayor of Jefferson. Sometimes, sometime after Satoris, Judge Stevens receives complaints that Miss Emily's property is issuing a bad smell, but so as not to humiliate the woman, he dispatches men to investigate the smell in secret and to neutralize it by spreading lime around Miss Emily's property. There's Toby, Miss Emily's black servant. Wyatt, Miss Emily's great aunt, according to the narrator, she went completely crazy, and in this, her fate foreshadows Emily's own. Um, major characters, Miss Emily Grierson. She's a proud woman born to a highly respected Southern family. Miss Emily seems frozen in the past, bearing herself aristocratically even when she is impoverished after her controlling father's death. Though her thoughts and feelings are as impenetrable as the imposing, decaying house in which she lives, Miss Emily is nonetheless subject to intense town scrutiny and gossip. The townspeople gossip about her haughtiness, her lack of a husband, and in the days after her father's death, her bizarre denial of his death and attempt to keep his corpse. But Miss Emily is not as frozen in the past as she first appears to be. After all, she becomes romantically involved with a laborer from the north named Homer Barron. Despite the Southern social convention that women of genteel heritage not marry men of a lower class, especially men from the north. 
Miss Emily seems to be, for the first time, taking control of her own life, despite what other people think. However, when it becomes apparent that Homer has no intention of marriage, which only further scandalizes the townspeople, Miss Emily goes to mad extremes to maintain control of her life. She poisons Homer and not only lives with, but sleeps next to his corpse, going so far as to create a tomb-like room for him, where she can relive forever the one hopeful, self-determined self period of her life. She becomes increasingly disconnected from her community, more and more reclusive, bloated-looking and pale, with iron-gray hair, more and more resistant to change, it is only after his death and funeral, her death and funeral that the townspeople realized how deeply, tragically damaged Miss Emily was. Uh, the townspeople. The story is narrated by we, the townspeople in general, who also play a role in Miss Emily's tragedy. The townspeople respect Miss Emily as a kind of li living monument to their glorified but lost pre-Civil War Southern past but are therefore also highly jud judgmental and gossipy about her, sometimes hypocritically. They think Miss Emily is too haughty and choose choosy when it comes to her romantic involvements, and yet when she begins to see Homer Barron, they think she is not choosy enough. For all that the townspeople scrutinize and judge Miss Emily, for all that they stick their noses in her business and intervene in her romantic affairs, they ironically fail to recognize that she is deeply damaged, even criminally insane, and they also fail to discover that she murdered Homer till some 40 years after the fact. Um, Homer Barron, the big, dark, ready foreman of a construction company that arrives in Jefferson to pave the sidewalks. Homer is from the north, but nonetheless becomes popular in town, a social drinker at the local Elks Club. His presence in Jefferson suggests the reunification of North and South after the Civil War, and he himself is an agent of progress and industrialization in a heretofore rigidly conservative community. Indeed, even Miss Emily falls for his charms, and the two become romantically involved with one another, riding together on Sundays in Homer's yellow-wheeled buggy. Despite the townspeople's judgmental gossip about his connection to the genteel southern Miss Emily. However, Homer is not a marrying man. So, des so, desperate to keep him with her, Miss Emily poisons Homer and keeps his corpse in her house. A ghastly husband indeed. It is evident she lies next to and even embraces his rotting flesh. Then there's Miss Emily's father, a proud southern gentleman controlling of his daughter, who thinks that no suitor is worthy of her hand in marriage. As a result, she never does marry when he is alive and is close to being beyond marriageable age after he dies. When he dies, Miss Emily insists for three days that he is not dead at all and would have kept his course, corpse had the town authorities not intervened. The Baptist minister and his wife, Scandalized by the relationship between Miss Emily and Homer, some ladies in town coerce the Baptist minister into speaking with Miss Emily. He does so, and the day after their meeting, the minister's wife writes to Miss Emily's two female cousins in Alabama, presumably advising them to come live with Miss Emily and oversee her conduct. Then there's Colonel Sir Terrace, the mayor of Jefferson in the 1890s. Sir Terrace is a representative of the old gen genteel pre-Civil War South. He was a Confederate colonel in the war, war. Sir Terrace passed a racist law that forces black women in Jefferson to wear their aprons in public. And in 1894, he comes to the financially impoverished Miss Emily's aid by excusing her from having to pay her taxes in Jefferson. The town authorities who succeeded him with their modern ideas are frustrated by this arrangement with Miss Emily, but are unable to change it. Now, Toby is listed by most people as a minor character. But I think he might be a bigger character than people think. 
most most research I've ever done doesn't mention Toby too much. But I have always wondered what made Toby stay with this family. They must have paid him pretty good. But then Miss Emily was impoverished. She couldn't have been paying him very good, right? What made Toby stay with Miss Emily, really? Did y'all think about that? I'm curious. Maybe somebody will broach the subject in the discussion board. What are your ideas? I have my own ideas, but I want to hear your ideas. What do you think made Toby stay? with Miss Emily. He had to have known that dead body was in that house. He had to have known. I don't think after she put his dead body in there that, you know, he let it. You know, they said it was kind of dusty and spider webby up in there. So she must not let him in there. But he had to have known that stank. It, you know, there's a pretty specific smell of a dead body. Once you smell it, you know what it is. Just, you know. Take my word for it. If you ever smell it, you'll have no guessing games on what it is. Okay? Um, you know. <laughs> um, why'd he stay? Why? Okay, now we're going to talk about symbols. There's the Grierson family house. Built during or just after the Reconstruction era in the 1870s, the Grierson family house, passed down from Emily's father to his daughter, was once grand and lovely, an embodiment of Southern pride and built in a style of ornate architecture of which defiantly recalls the plantation houses of the Old South from before the Civil War. This house and those like it are monuments that symbolize for the townspeople of Jefferson the glorified aristocratic past of the South. But the house is also a more complex symbol than that. It is, after all, physically decaying. The narrator even calls it an eyesore. And the highly respected neighborhood in which the house is located is being encroached upon by garages and cotton gins, structures of industrialization, signs of cultural and social progress. As such, the house also comes to symbolize just how untendable the cultural culture of the Old South is, its moral ugliness in its foundation on slavery and its irrelevance in the face of the modern world, a world increasingly reliant not on agriculture but on industry. A world that increasingly holds not aristocratic, but democratic values. However, as ugly as the house is on the outside, the inside is pure ghastliness and nightmare. A literal tomb where Homer Barron's corpse rots. In this, its condition reflects that of Miss Emily herself. More and more impoverished as the years pass, more and more desecrate. Both house and owner present merely a proud face to the public, which conceals eccentric desires and dreadful secrets within. Moreover, Faulkner is suggesting that the Southerners attempt to freeze time and in some ways relive the Confederate past is, at its core, as profoundly unnatural and grotesque as Miss Emily's preservation of her dead sweetheart. It is in this way that his story breaks down the walls of Southern nostalgia to reveal the social and moral harms thereof. All right, Miss Emily's hair. In a sense, one of our greatest sources of insight into Miss Emily's character, who she is and how she changes, is her, shockingly enough, her hair. For example, after her father dies, Miss Emily falls ill for a long time. When she reappears in public, her hair was cut short, making her look like a little girl. 
Earlier, Miss Emily denies that her father is really dead, and her subsequent girlish haircut only seems like a subtle affirmation of this denial, a sign that she still thinks of herself as Daddy's little girl, as it were. Later, after Homer Baron disappears into the Grierson house, Miss Emily is next seen with iron gray hair, like the hair of an active man. First, like an iron helmet, the iron gray hair suggests that Miss Emily has something to protect, and indeed she is protecting a dreadful secret, Homer's murder. Second, that her hair resembles the hair of an active man, suggests that Miss Emily has rejected her community's norms for female conduct, which she indeed has, albeit perversely so, in asserting her control over Homer by murdering him. And finally, it is only by discovering a strand of Miss Emily's hair on a pillow next to Homer's corpse that the townspeople realize just how damaged, even criminally insane, Miss Emily was. Given all of this, we might conclude that Miss Emily's hair symbolizes both the woman's turbulent mental life as well as her radical isolation from her community. All right, that concludes your lecture. If you have any questions, want to make any comments, do so in the discussion board. And goodbye.